Open your Bibles to Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning. I pray that you help us uh, to learn from your word, to uh, apply the principles in our lives, and that your name would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. So Hebrews 11, let's go from verse, starting verse 8. By faith... Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder, and builder is uh, God. Amen. So, we, we see here that Abram in Genesis 12, and you can go to Genesis 12 as I speak, and Abram received um, a promise. And we started talking about the covenant of works and in the covenant of works last week we talked about the imperative leading to the indicative right it's like the grammar of the covenant so don't do this and you will live that's what God said to Adam and Eve don't eat from the fruit and you will live. Now, in the covenant of grace, God does in a different way. God first gives the indicative, and then the imperative will follow. So, I will give you this land. I, I will give you the promise I'm making a covenant with you. That's why you obey. So Abram is obeying the Lord not to receive the promise. He's obeying the Lord because he had already received the promise. So the promise is not something that Abram will achieve. He already has that promise. So he's Walking in faith is believing in the promise of God. So, in that sense, the covenant of work, right? Covenant of work and the covenant of grace, they are different. Here, Adam and Eve, they need to perform to live. Here, it's not about their doing. It's about the promise of God. So, why are we emphasizing that in the Old Testament? We want to make sure that we understand that the gospel and God's grace is not a New Testament thing. It's throughout the whole Bible. God is promising, is making covenant with His children... And they will obey that by faith. So, with that being said, salvation in the Old Testament is the same as in the New Testament. Salvation is through Christ alone. And of course, 
Abram, David, they didn't know Christ like Peter or Matthew, but they were putting their faith in the promise to come. So it's the same. And for us today, we look back to the cross. For Abraham, for David, they were looking ahead of them to the promise of God. Okay? Is there anything that from last week that you would like to comment or ask a question? Do you even remember what we talked? <laughs> That's another question, right? <laughs> we, we read Genesis 3. Remember that? We're talking about the sin. What else we talked about? I'm thinking of doing a test next week. So, And after the fall, what did God do? They were covering themselves with, with the fig and then God covered them with the, the skins of an animal. So it's like the proto-evangelion, the, the first idea of the gospel. There we have an animal was sacrificed to cover someone else's sin. Uh, yes? Speak up, please. Yes, the imperative on the covenant of works that God did with Adam and Eve is don't eat from this tree. But there, there are, are there other uh, imperatives? The imperative um, about, yes. The, the imperative is a little bit broader than the other trees. Uh -huh. Perfect obedience. So upon condition of perfect obedience, that was what the imperative was, order. Mm -hmm. But for example, when, when the, uh, God talked about the cultural mandate, mm -hmm. it is an imperative. Before the fall, when we talked about worship, the Sabbath, work, and marriage? Yes. Yes. So those three were the imperatives. But also yeah, but the, the tree had a consequence for if. The consequence was explicitly in, expressed in, the, in that because they uh, were trying to be like God. They're trying to rebel against God. They tried to be their own gods. And, but God told them to do these things, worship, work, and have families. And once they disobeyed, sin now enters and affects everything that man does. So in a sense, the gospel is bringing us back to the reality of the, the way that God created the world. But sin is making these connections. So we are to obey God because he saved us. He gives us the covenant. And we are to obey God not only in our worship or our spiritual area, but in worship, work, in family, in everything that we do. So that's what the gospel is taking us back to. And that's why we, we're going to live in new heavens and new earth. And the, this word from the scripture is not a brand new that God will create a brand new heavens and earth. It's a renewed heaven and earth. So God will change. He will, the consummation will do that. So we will be back in the state that God created us to be. In that sense. So looking at Genesis uh, 12, and we are we're trying today to answer a few questions. Is it one covenant that God has with Abraham or two? Is it unilateral or bilateral? Is it unconditional or conditional? 
Is it a physical blessing or just a spiritual blessing that God has with his people? But let's have a look in the first three verses of Genesis 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and, I, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So, we have Abram as the target of the covenant. God tells him, you go, go Abram, go and I will make you into a great nation. So he is the target, right? He is, God is looking at him and say, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make you a great name. And you will see in 2 Samuel that God says the same thing about David. Um, so when God makes this promise to Abram, he's targeting him. But also, he's the target, but he's also a, an instrument of the bless, of the covenant. Be a blessing. So, it's not only Abram that receives, but also through him. Through Abram. Why? I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. In you, all nations will be blessed. So, God is already expressing his love, covenantal love for the world. Not only the Jews, not only Israel, but the whole world is pointing here. So God wants to bless you individually. He does. But he does not want to bless you to stay there. He wants to bless you in order that you would be a blessing to others. And then in doing that, the name of God will be glorified. So, you're not the most important person in the universe. In a sense, only Jesus, right? We, our purpose here is to make the name of God glorified, glorious. So, the, the goal of receiving blessings from the Lord is to glorify His name. So if you are selfish, if we are selfish, if we just receive the blessings as the target of a blessing, and we are target of God's blessing through Jesus, yes, and through Abram as well, when God promised these promises here to Abram, He was thinking about us as well. But it's not to stay here. So there's a lot of preaching happening, and we, uh, we see like, Preaching, pre twisting the words of the Bible in order to satisfy your desire to be that special person or, and, and the king of the world and so on and so forth. That's not the goal. The goal is that we receive God's blessing to do what? To bless others. It never stays with us. So this, that's why we need to be generous. And generous financially, yes, Generous with our time, generous with forgiving others, generous with investing in others, helping others grow. I don't know uh, if I told you this story, but when I was 11 or 12, I was learning to play guitar with this teacher. She was a really good player. And she, in the first lesson, she told me, I only teach half what I know to students because I have to always be better than my students. Is that a good teacher? No. No. You know when you see a good teacher, his students are always better than him. 
like they, they push them and throw them there. If you train people to be better than you, you're doing a really good job. So that's the, the biblical idea of mentoring or discipling. We, have to, we need that desire of, I want to help you grow and go further. That's what I want for my kids, right? We all want that for our kids. Yes? Now, the first part is just go. And in faith, he leaves his home. His father and his family, they worshiped idols. So God wanted to, for Abram to leave them behind and just, and just go. So the first part of the, the promise is even his name is Abram now. In chapter 15 uh, he, or 17. He changes, yeah, 17. God changes his name, but he doesn't have all the answers. He doesn't. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons that they had Ishmael, because God promised them, you will have a son, and he waited like for more than 10 years, and there was no son. He was getting old. And Sarah said, okay, just have Hagar and, and have a child from her. Um, he was trying to work his, his, the promise of God for himself. That doesn't help very much. So in verse 4 of chapter 12, it says, So Abram went as the Lord told him. So he goes by faith. He believes in God. Um, verse 7, we see, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give you this land. And to your offspring I will give this land. It goes, it has a, a reference of the seed. Remembering Genesis 3, the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent. To your seed, it's always pointing to that, that one day would be, the, uh, would be Jesus. The one fulfilling all the promises. Um, and you have a child, verse 7. So God promises a child and the land to Abram. And what does Abram do? So he built there, verse 7. So he built there an altar, altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. So it results in worship. They receive, Abram receives the promise of the Lord. He obeys. God uh, promises that he will have a child in the land. And what does he do? Worship. Um, we won't have time to go... Uh, a lot in chapter 13, but it's talking about his nephew, Lot. And he, he gave, uh, they were growing in the, the animals and riches, and they had to separate. So Abram gives Lot the decision. So you choose. And Lot goes where? Goes to the side of Sodom. He goes to the side where um, it's, isn't that a great analogy about our free will? When we get to choose because of our nature, we will always have this tendency of choosing what's against our own nature, about sin. And um, free will in that sense of being totally uh, no biased or having no uh, format to choose is, is not, it's only happened to Adam. 
for us, we always choose based on sin, if we're let. It doesn't mean that we don't have volition. We choose to do things, but there's always that uh, tendency to do that. So the gospel, when we believe in God and we, we have faith in God, what God does in us is He gives us the ability to goes against, go against that, but not completely yet. We're, we still live in the fallen nature. We still have that. But one day, we will not have that anymore. So, um, God reiterates the promise to Abram in chapter 13. And what is his response? The Lord, verse 14, chapter 13, verse 14. The Lord said to Abram, after the Lord had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. I'll make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if uh, one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Have you ever tried cu counting your, like sand? It's impossible. <laughs> Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. And what does he do? He moved his tent and came and settled, and there he built an altar to the Lord. The result, again, is worship. Every time that God uh, gives the promise to Abram and reminds him of the promise, what does he do? He worships. He worships. What do we do every Sunday? We are reminded of God's covenant in Christ. And what do we respond we respond in worship. We come here. We remember that he was dead for our sins. But not only that. But that he was uh, risen. So we celebrate that. And we worship the Lord for that. Um, in chapter 14. Lot is in danger. So Abram goes and rescues him. But the end, in the end of chapter 14 you see that it's a miracle the way that he, he goes with 318 people, Abram. It's again, um, if you remember the, the sermons on Joshua, it's again showing him the stacks that the battle and victory belongs to the Lord, right? How does he de defeat these kings? Because the Lord is the one who wins your battles. And... Um, from verses 17, chapter 14, he returned from the defeat and he meets Melchizedek. Verses 19, and he blessed him. Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. God was the one who delivered Abram and the enemies. And what does Abram do? He gives an offering. First time, there was no rule in Israel to do that, like we see in Malachi 3.10. There was no rule there. But Abram gives a tenth of everything he has because it's an act of worship. Here. And... The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. Abram emphatically says, I don't want anything for you. You know, it's like Abram is saying, You're not going on my CV, you know. You're not, you, I don't want anything from you. I don't want you saying, Oh, I, I made Abraham, Abram rich. I, no, it was the Lord. And he says in verse 24, I'll take nothing but what the young men have eaten, and the share of the man who went with me. Let other people have their share. I don't want anything. So this is the, the framework before ver, uh, chapter 15. And in this narrative, you see that God is promising Abram a land. He leaves the country and then God reminds him the, the promise, 
and he worships. And then God re reminds him the covenant, and he worships. So, if Abram, which he would become Abraham, is known as the father of the faith, he needed to be reminded of the covenant so much. What do we think about us? Right? We need to have that in mind all the time. That's why uh, when, when we preach, we say we need to be reminded of the gospel. We need to be reminded what God did for us. Because we're so forgetful. It's so easy to forget. The first thing that, the first trial that we have in front of us, we murmur or we lose heart. Or it's so easy to do that. We complain. Well, the Lord did everything for you, and He helped you, and He saved you, and everything. And then it's so easy to, to lose sight of that. So God knows us. And in the Word, we see that Abram, even though he was the father of the faith, he was a man that was born in sin and needed God's grace. So he needed to be reminded of the promise. And then we got to chapter 15. In in chapter 15, we see here the covenant was finally formalized. The covenant and the, one of the, the main themes that Paul brings a lot in Romans, in Galatians, um, it's what? In verse 6, what's that theme? Yes, so Genesis 15, 6. And the nomenclature is justification by? Justification. By faith, he, he believed in God and became to him what? Righteousness. Righteousness. He was considered, he was uh, called, he was justified. He was he was not justified because he left the country, because he obeyed. He was able to obey God because God promised him. Because God gave the covenant. So he believed in God. And that faith was the very thing that justified him. So, from verses 1 to 6, we see... The, the promise, the question, he questions God. Verse 3, And Abraham, Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Can you believe that? <laughs> Abram said that. You, God, you gave me no. It, it just, it's an echo from Genesis 3. It was the woman that you gave me. <clears throat> right? You said that it was not good for me to be alone. And now the woman that you gave me did that. She ate from the fruit. It's, it's again... A reminder, it's uh, another time that he forgets the, the promise. Imagine this. There's a handsome man. He is a uh, very, very successful, handsome, strong. Everybody look up to him. And it's his wedding day. And here comes his bride. Uh, not good-looking bride with her, her dirty dress and she, he receives her and they start to uh, vow to each other. And at the moment that the wife starts to speak and he shuts her and says, no, here I am the only one who will give the promises. I don't expect anything from you. I am the one. 
giving you the promise. That's what God did with us. We were all in sin. We, ke- we cannot keep our promises. We cannot do that. And God is the one doing the promise on our behalf because He loves us. Um, so, verses 7 through 21. Actually, we, we read verse 3, right? Um, God said that your servant would not, verse 4, your servant would not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And what does God do? He opens his perspective to know who, really, who God really is. He takes him out of the tent and said, look toward heaven. And number the stars if you're able to number them. God reminds Abram who he is. And God also reminds Abram who God is. Try to count the stars. Try it. You can't even (laughs) count the stars that you can see. I not only can count them, but I give them names, and I know them by name. Who are you, Abram? Stay in your lane. Believe in me. Right? And then God, but God doesn't do, um, speak harsh to him like that. But God says, look, try to count the stars. Then God says, this shall be your offspring. And what does Abram do? He believed in God. He believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. So he said, I am the Lord, verse 7. He, he took, took you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. So now God's, in this covenant, God was giving about the seed, verses 1 through 6. And now it's about the land. It's a promise of the land. There's also a question. Again, Abram questions God. And God gives him a vision. Uh, God asks him to do something that is visual. And makes a covenant with him. Because God said, oh, Abram said, verse 8. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He had just promised the offspring as the stars and he is still asking these questions he said to him bring me a heifer three years old female goat three years old and a ram and he brought to him all these and cut in half he did not cut the birds in half the sun was going down Then the Lord said, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that's not theirs. He's talking about um, Israel in Egypt for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation. Verse 15, As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation. Um, Verse 17, Verse 17, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the, these pieces. So God, the illustration I gave about the, the groom and the bride, God was the only one promising here in this covenant. It was customary for them to cut animals in half and both of the, the, the parties in the um, Pact in the covenant would pass through the animals as, as saying that, may this happen to us if I don't keep my word. But in this case, Abram does not walk with God. It's only God, only the fire of God. And God is saying, I am keeping my word. So, these are the 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 formalization of the the covenant of God. Then we have Hagar, chapter 16. Um, 
they try to work the promises of God. Um, let's not judge Abram a lot. I know it, like more than, I think 10 years was passed here. They were just getting old and older. So they're trying to do their own way. So they did that. Um, even though it's, it was not the, what the Lord um, told them to do. And it's, it's a chapter of showing that's a, fa a failure, their failure. But that Sarah, Sarah de dealt with Hagar because she was mocking Sarah. She was dealing with her harshly. And it's the same expression that we have in Exodus for the way that Pharaoh was dealing with the Israelites harshly. They were putting them to work more, to build the, the tiles, and they were working and, and, and making them suffer harshly. But when we get to chapter 17, we have the confirmation of the covenant. So, the sign of the covenant is what God asks. It's not, it's not a different covenant. It's not two covenants. It's the same covenant. But God is asking for a sign to Abraham. Um, in, in Romans, let's go to Romans 4, verse 11. Romans 4, it's talking about Abraham. Verse 11 said, He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that the righteousness would be counted to them as well. So, circumcision here is not what saved Abram. It's not uh, a, a means that would bring him a, a, a way of a place of righteousness before God, but it is a sign. And remember, the word covenant means to cut. And remember the the ritual for the covenant, they cut the animals in half and they pass in the middle. So um, God, God's in intention here is to confirm his oath, his promise um, about to his progeny, to his offspring. And he does that. He asks Abraham, he changes his name. And he asked Abraham to do the sign of the covenant. Verse 5, no longer, 17 verse 5, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I'll make you exceedingly fruitful, and I'll make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between you, me and you and your offspring after, throughout their generations from an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. So it's not a covenant to say I'm part of this group. This covenant is saying I am your God and you are mine. That's the sign that they're doing. And they cut the male organ and in that in that time the male of the family would also cover for the female of the, the family so that that why there is no need for women to do that so the man would represent the, his household his family this sign was for him and for his family we see that constantly in the scriptures the sign is for you and your household, for you and your households. It's, it's interesting to see that in the New Testament, when, when um, people 
we have the stories of people being converted, there's only one case that the individual is baptized, but not the family. It's the eunuch in Acts 8. The, an eunuch, it has no family, right? But the rest, you see the centurion, you see the guard in the priest, like everybody's to you and your household, to you and your household. So God's intention is to, to have this sign of the covenant to, um, as a response that you put your faith in him. So that's God's intention. And the sign of circumcision is given. Verse 9. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring, after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. God does not require Abraham to be circumcised before he gives the covenant. Now, God doesn't say, now, to talk to me, you need to be circumcised first, then I'll tell you about my promise. No. God promises him and reminds him the promise and do it again. He does it again and again. And then God says, okay, now you do the sign of the covenant. And the sign of the covenant does not mean salvation. The sign of the covenant, it means a, a confirmation for you that you are part of this group, that you're part of the God's people. So um, we stop in verse 11 now. You shall be circumcised in the flesh between me and 12. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male throughout your generations whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not your offspring. Question, does this baby who is eight, years old, uh, eight days old, does he have uh, knowledge? Is he doing that by faith, the baby? No. Whose faith is this baby doing that circumcision? The father. So, the sign of the covenant is a sign that the parents impart to their children. I'm not saying that they are part, they are part of the, uh, they are saved because of that. They're not saved by the sign, right? You can see in the Bible that the sons of Jacob, you have Esau and you have Jacob, both circumcised. But one of them was not saved. You have the sons of um, Eli, Eli the, the priest in 1 Samuel. So having the circumcision is not a guarantee. What is a guarantee of salvation? Faith. In this case of the Old Testament, faith in the promises of God, in that God would send someone. In our case now, faith in Jesus. And you, I hope you notice that I'm bringing this, this topic of circumcision, but it also tends to baptism in the New Testament. Um, we will have a, another class about that, specifically about infant baptism. But you see now that when Abraham did that to, to Isaac, when he circumcised him, of course Isaac did not have faith. He would have to profess his faith when he was older. He would have to say, the God of my father is my God, right? To confirm that because you're saved because you put your faith in Christ. So Mike cannot come and, and, and say, Caitlin, you believe in God because God is my God. Yeah, there's an age that she grows up and she has to decide that to follow the Lord. She has to respond in faith. So... When we do that, we are, when we circumcise, when they circumcise their kids, they're saying these kids, these children, they are part of the covenant. They are part of the people of God, 
and they will receive the benefits of the people of God. And Abraham did that. He was born in his household. He, <coughs> Abraham falls in his face before the Lord, and he does what? He worships the Lord. He obeys the Lord. And if there was a foreigner, an adult that was foreigner, if he wanted to be part of the group, what did he have to do? To be circumcised. If he had faith that God is the God of Israel, he would have to be circumcised to show the sign of the covenant, to show that you're part. If, if, it's like God is saying, if, you're not, if you don't cut off, you'll be cut off. <laughs> you know? So... Um, this sign and, and this action of circumcision, it's not a new thing for, for them now in this context. Other peoples around them used to do that as a, like a hygiene thing, you know. Uh, so God is using something that is common here to this culture. God is using that and he's saying this will be the sign of my covenant. First of all, the males in your group will be like clean, but also this shows that you have a sign of the, the covenant with me. Um, but this is what God does. I, I wanted to talk about the sign of the covenant. I don't have more time, but the last part is that I will speak next week is how does the sign of the covenant was intended to be in the heart not necessarily in the flesh. Because throughout the Old Testament, God is also reminding them, you are uncircumcised in your hearts. You have people that are circumcised in the flesh, but you don't love the Lord. You're doing this sign of the covenant, but you live as you don't know me. You live as I'm not your God. You have again and again and again, Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, we have the prophets saying that. And... When we see the prophet saying that, there will come a day that you will worship me and you have circumcised hearts. So, this is, this is more important than the sign itself. Because if we have the sign of the covenant, but we don't circumcise our hearts before the Lord, why? Why do it? It's, it's the same like coming to church and saying that you're a Christian, but you don't believe in God. Your actions or your, your lifestyle, you don't, you don't honor the Lord. You don't love Him. You don't have relationship with the Lord. You just do these weekly thing, you know. You check a box. Oh, I did this, I did this. That's not God's intention. So you love the Lord with your, all your mind, all your heart, all your soul. And you do that because you love Him. So, I want to focus on that next time. And the week after that, we have two lessons more with Jim. Because we were talking about his, his trip to the churches. And he's preparing, or has already prepared, a, a set of lessons that he wants to share with us what the trip was. But also connect that with the biblical teachings and the, the biblical views that he had that it was a, for him, it was a really good experience to be in the sights of the churches. And, you know, um, I think something with the order of the, 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 the sites that he went, it was different from the Bible, I think. But it was a way that he, he was learning. And even the chat, if you saw the videos that Pastor Jim was also sharing. So... Uh, and then we will go back. So after we talk about this circumcision of hearts, and maybe if we have time, we talk about infant baptism. Then after uh, these two weeks of having gym in Sunday school, we will go back to um, to finish the the members' idea of class. So we're going more than ten weeks that I intended, but I think it's going well so far. I hope I hope you are learning. Uh, and if you're, if you're, if you have any questions, if you have any anything that you want to ask, please don't, don't 
stay with your questions. We would like to answer. And if I don't know them, you can ask Mike. And <laughs> just fine. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this Sunday school. I pray, Lord, that as, as we learn about the covenant of grace, the covenant that you made with Abraham, with, and then Abraham, um, that we would learn from that and that our hearts would be circumcised, that our hearts would be uh, changed, not by the, the sign or the action of, of circumcision itself, but that our hearts would be circumcised and be before you. We're so thankful for this morning. Help us in this Sunday worship in a few minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.